Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Enrico Azurt and I'm one of the parents and, and researchers that collaborate here at the Autism Research Coalition. Uh, today, we, today we have the great, great honor of welcoming uh, a, a very, very good friend of ours, uh, Dr. Uh, Willem Shaw, that is going to be uh, doing a, a live webinar for us and also uh, my good friend, uh, Patricia Lemmer. Uh, so, so thank you so much, uh, both of you for joining us today. You're welcome. It's great to be back and to see my good friend, Bill Shaw. Yeah, so, so actually uh, today the, the, the program is going to be hosted by, by Patty. So, so thank you for doing that, Patty. Uh, just, uh, just as a matter of introduction for, to our audience, uh, let, me, let me introduce both of you. Uh, uh, ladies, ladies first. Uh, so Ms. Ms. Lemmer, she is a, a licensed professional counselor. Uh, she, has, she has practiced as an educational diagnostician for over 40 years. Uh, she's the, the co-founder of, uh, uh, of and, and, and has served as executive director of developmental delay resources uh, for, for a very long time. Uh, she is the author uh, of the book, uh, very well uh, renowned, and, and uh, you know, a book that has received a lot of, a lot of awards, uh, Art Smart in Autism. So, so very, very impressive background. And, and Dr. Shaw, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Shaw, he is a board certified uh, in, in the fields of uh, clinical chemistry and toxicology by the American Board and, 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 uh, of, of Clinical Chemistry. And before he, he uh, before this, he founded the, before he, he founded the Great Place uh, Laboratory, uh, Dr. Shaw worked for the Centers uh, for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC here in the United States, uh, in, the, in the Children's Mercy Hospital and the University of Missouri at Kansas City School of Medicine, and also worked at Smith Klein Laboratories. Uh, he's the author of Biological Treatments for Autism and PDD, originally published in 1998, and Autism Beyond the Basics, published in 2009. Uh, he is also a frequent speaker at uh, conferences worldwide and now here with us. Um, and and Dr. Dr. Shaw is actually the stepfather of a child with autism himself and has helped thousands of patients and, and medical practitioners uh, around the world to successfully improve the lives of people with autism, ADHD, Alzheimer's disease, arthritis, bipolar disorder, and several other um, serious disorders. Um, so in today's live chat, I mean, Dr. Shaw is going to walk, uh, walk us through some of the uh, research that, that himself and, you know, Dr. Uh, Sidney Baker did on, on this case of uh, infection by Aspergillus and, and some of the tests that, that he conducts at his uh, laboratory in Great Plains. So without further ado, uh, guys, please take it away. So I'm so honored to do this again with you, Enrique and um, Bill Shaw and I go way back. We were chatting before we went on the air. I think we've known each other for about 30 years. And when I founded Developmental Delay Resources, you were at Children's Mercy Hospital as a biochemist testing urine samples. <laughs> and I remember when you came up with these yeast metabolites in the urine samples of brothers who you later found out had autism. And that set you down this path of figuring out what these fungi and molds were all about. 30 years ago, and here we are back at looking at fungi and molds. And I just think it's remarkable because you were such a pioneer then with, with your discoveries. And now Great Plains Laboratory, you told me was celebrating its 25th anniversary. And we're still looking at this, this subject and you were one of the largest labs in the world, if not the largest lab in the world, you told me on all continents except Antarctica. So <laughs> I won't take any more of your time because everybody's waiting to hear about Aspergillus and, and, and Clostridia and everything else that makes people sick and causes autism. So take it away. Okay, thank you very much. Uh... Patty, and, and uh, thank you, uh, Enrique, for this opportunity. Uh, the, uh, I'm in San Diego this afternoon, but the background is prettier than my hotel room. So <laughs> the, uh, I put in a background from my, uh, in, from my speaking tour in China, and it's the water lilies in, uh, in uh, Beijing. So 
So uh, we're going to talk about the the uh, the um, the world of fungi. So a very important world, uh, and and one that was uh, that was first discovered in in uh, these brothers uh, with autism a long uh, a long uh, time ago. So this information is is um, is uh, uh, very, very useful. So uh, the, the microorganisms in the intestinal tract are a major factor in autism. And that was information that I was learning uh, uh, many years ago. And it's taken quite a while to, to uh, uncover all the, all the different uh, players in this zoo of microorganisms. So uh, what you have here in front of you is the uh, microscopic view of a mold, uh, which it, that's another name for fungus of called Aspergillus fumigatus. Aspergillus is the genus. There are about a hundred or more different species of Aspergillus, but fumigatus is one of the uh, more toxic and uh, a recent study found that antibodies against Aspergillus fumigatus were found on almost 93% of children with autism. So this is a major important uh, study. Why do these children have uh, high amounts of the antibodies against this very uh, toxic mold? One that's responsible for, it's responsible of all the uh, different molds, it's the one that is most lethal, and yet it's almost never, uh, never uh, lethal in autism. So there are many different uh, sources of mold, and and, um, and let's see. Okay, and and uh, so alcoholic beverages can can uh, be one because the, uh, the alcoholic beverages are made by fermentation. And if there's moles in the different grains used to produce alcohol, uh, the different mold toxins can be present in the alcoholic beverages. Corn, wheat, all the grains are sources of, of mold. Sugar cane, sugar beets, cottonseed, peanuts, peanuts, are a source because peanuts grow under the ground. And so the soil is full of mold. So peanuts are a very big source of mold as well. Uh, rye is even harder, is even higher, sorghum and certain cheeses. Uh, many of you have seen bread that sat too long in your cupboard and it has got uh, mold all over it. And certain of the molds are much more toxic than others, but I, I don't think I would try eating any of these that uh, have these off colors unless you're uh, starving. So in addition to food, mold is commonly found in water damaged houses, offices, or schools. So that's a, a major a, a, a major source of mold. And probably in the United States, it's probably much more common than getting mold from, from food. And here you see the person working with some diluted bleach and, and you can see he's got rubber gloves and the rubber gloves are all covered with the black stuff that is the uh, mold. And there's uh, mold comes in many different colors. Some of you may heard that there uh, a mold that's commonly very toxic, stachybotrys, but there can be uh, other types of mold that also have the black color. So you can't you can't identify the mold just from the uh, color that's present. But you have to be extremely uh, careful. You see, the person has a mask on rubber gloves and et cetera. So a lot of times this is best left to the uh, 
professional to clear this out. So the first references to, uh, to mold were found in the Bible in the Old Testament. And this is from one of the first chapters in the Bible called Leviticus. Uh, chapter 14, which is estimated was written about 500 BC, so 20, roughly 2,500 years ago. And this is just a portion because this goes on for pages, but I'll read just a portion. And he that owns the house shall come and tell the priest, saying, it seems to me there is, as it were, a plague, or in some uh, a translation, a leprosy in the house. Then the priest shall command that they empty the house for the, before the priests go into it to see the plague. And afterwards, the priest shall go in to see the house. And he shall look on the plague. And behold, if the plague be in the walls of the house with streaks, greenish or reddish, which in sight are lower than the wall, then the priest shall go out of the house to the door of the house and shut up the house for seven days. And really what they're talking about is mold. So mold has been around as a problem for, for at least 2,500 uh, years to the point that it gets a, a significant section of, uh, of uh, Leviticus. And it goes on to say, if the mold is still there, you all the, uh, the pieces of the house have to re be removed and thrown into the uh, garbage dump and replaced. So, so it was recognized for many years that mold was a significant uh, health problem. Uh, mold uh, frequently is breathed into the, uh, in, in, into the uh, trachea and into the lungs, but you see in the lungs, there are these cilia that, that, that move uh, particles and mold that's in there moves that up. And as they move it up, then the, the mold that is moved up out of, the, uh, out, out of the trachea is swallowed and then gets into the GI tract. So mold can be found in the lungs, but because of the cilia that move it the mold out of the trachea, it can also be in the GI tract. This shows a house that's absolutely covered with mold. So you see the person is in one of these uh, spacesuits that the, uh, the mold is so hazardous. Matter of fact, this house is sadly so infested, it may be that the best thing is just to uh, demolish it. How long does it take Bill to get to look that bad? Well, probably well, one flood is probably enough. So, so some of these places that have had hurricanes in Florida or in Texas, it it can be it can be uh, uh, just a single flood uh, in which a significant portion of the house is is becomes damp that this kind of thing can happen. So, so, so uh, you can see though, if you just look at the, wa uh, the wallpaper, you think, oh, there's no problem. But when you peel the wallpaper away, you see it's absolutely just completely covered uh, with mold. So it's very important if you have water damage to get it, don't delay, get it cleaned up right away or, or you're, you're very likely to have this experience, even though the wallpaper looks okay, the 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 the, uh, the wall and back is is severely infested and is, and will cause major medical issues. So uh, here's an example of of uh, mold testing uh, that was done, and and. Uh, in each one of these, so this is saying upstairs, Southwest uh, apartment, they have a sample number, how much of the air was examined. So they have ways of sucking in the air and measuring the amount of mold uh, in the air. 
And so that what they say is, um, these are the different kinds of mold. And there's not, in this apartment, there's, uh, in this particular part house, not very much, just one spore. And so they estimate if they extrapolated it per cubic meter, which is right here, meter cubed. So a meter is, um, is uh, three feet. So that's three by three uh, or uh, three feet. That's like nine uh, cubic feet of air. But uh, they, they uh, give an estimate of how much and it's light. So most of the house, light, 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 very little. But then if you look at the study on the first floor, um, you see a gigantic number of uh, molds, an estimated 170,000 spores per cubic meter. And the estimate, and even that they estimate as moderate. I would say if you have this, it's more than likely going to cause you severe problems. So this is what they, this is the actual place that they had studied and it looks okay. So this is the thing about the stuff is hiding behind the walls. Um, so the air was absolutely full. So it's obviously coming from somewhere. And this is the situation that when they, when they tore out the walls, there was mold everywhere uh, in the study. And, and in this particular case, it was the father who was suffering from the mold problem because he was using this room. All the other rooms were, were uh, essentially mold free or very low mount. But this particular one, I think they had a leak in the roof at one time. And so all the walls were severely uh, covered, so they had to replace all of the uh, all of the wallboard, all and even some of the regular wood had to be stripped down to the two by fours in order to clean this uh, problem up. So it's very important to know that mold can be highly localized. There may be no mold in parts of the house, and then very severe mold in others. So a lot of what I talked about was associated with the one of the first uh, papers that was published in the field of autism and where I looked at a number of, of, um, of children with autism in one of the first autism studies uh, with my colleagues, my, the medical technologist, Ellen Casson and a pediatric neurologist, Enrique uh, Chavez, at the Children's Hospital uh, in Kansas City. And there were 21 male children with autism based on the diagnosis of the board-certified pediatric neurologist, Enrique uh, Chavez. Uh, there were two females, but the but with such a, and this is because autism is not as common in females as males. So as a consequence, we had fewer show up. But the thing is, we couldn't say anything of significance because we only had two cases where we had 21 children, male children with autism. We did a baseline urine organic acid before treatment. And then we did another organic acid 10 days after the use of nystatin, an antifungal drug that is not absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract. So many, uh, uh, many antifungal drugs are absorbed from the, from the intestinal tract by nystatin is one that is not. And so the study was paid for by a grant from Pfizer. The original study was going to use the drug uh, Diflucan, but the uh, the medical safety board wouldn't approve uh, Diflucan, and so we had to use Nystatin, a drug that was not as uh, potent as uh, as uh, Diflucan. And and here are the results of the um, 
Uh, the children with autism, and this is only the males compared to uh, normal control children. So here you see that this is the mean value for a number of these compounds that we suspected were from microorganisms. And you see here's the, the different values. And here are the values of, excuse me, here are the, this is a, a control values and this is the value of the children with autism. So control values for this were 1.1, but the mean for, uh, for males with autism were 3.84. So, so then you do a test for statistical significance called the t-test and anything less than 0.05 is considered highly significant, which this was. And another thing you can do is you can see how much higher are the, uh, are the values with autism compared to the normal. So it's saying that for this first marker determined by the mass spectrometer, it was about three and a half times higher on average. For the next one, 2.7. For this one, we couldn't, we couldn't use the same test because the value in the uh, normal children was zero, so you can't divide by zero, so we don't have a value for that. But all of these, um, or most of these values were higher in the group with autism. But the arobinose was the one that you found, wasn't it? Then the yes, that, that was one of the ones we identified. Yeah. And we, we, and we also said that a likely a number of these were also due to uh, mold as well. And, and so what we reason though is that, the, that the, uh, these would probably also be reduced by the use of uh, antifungal drugs, nystatin. So, so we compared the, the values of the children uh, at baseline with the, uh, with the numbers uh, after uh, 10 days of Nystatin. Oops, I'm gonna go back on that. And so for citramalic, for example, there was a 21% decrease after 10 days of Nystatin. For this compound, which is associated with aspergillus mold, there was a 56% decrease. Um, and then for, uh, for almost all of these, there was a significant decrease. The one that wasn't, one that ended up being significant was one called 3-3-hydroxyphenyl, three, 3-hydroxypropionic three acid. Initially, we thought was due to yeast, but later we found was due to clostridium. So the problem was that following nystatin, the the compound from Clostridia got worse. And so that is one of the problems is that we found if you only treated yeast or fungus, the Clostridia compounds got worse. If you only treated Clostridia, sometimes the yeast problems would become worse. So an important factor of this is that you had to treat both these problems simultaneously in order to get the best results. Uh, here's the compound from that is produced by aspergillus called 2,5-furan uh, acid. Uh, so if you're a chemist, fine. If you're not a chemist, this isn't, it's not important. But for the technical people, I include it. So it's interesting to know. So this is a furan ring, which means it's a five member ring. See, it has five atoms at the piece, at the juncture of the chemical bonds and it contains an oxygen here uh, in the middle and it has two carboxylic acid groups here and here. And the two five just means the ring is numbered two and five, this is the two and five position. There's also a compound in which the carboxylic acid becomes a, what is called a hydroxymethyl group. And there's one in which glycine is added. Glycine is added by 
mammals in order to detoxify toxic chemicals. So the, it forms a compound called a furanyl carbonyl glycine or furyl glycine. And these are the scientific references that these compounds are produced by different species of aspergillus. So it's interesting is that, uh, is that the early scientific works all were coming out of Japan. Uh, a, a very important uh, paper came out in 2019 by a researcher named uh, Dr. Markova, who is a specialist in the field of, of fungus and mold. And what she found is that there were uh, abnormal microorganisms in autistic children and their mothers, and that there was a high amounts of, of uh, mold in which there were cell wall deficient L-form variants in the blood. So what were found were not complete uh, fungus, but you could think of them as being, as being uh, partial uh, fungus rather than being complete fungus. They were missing this important part, but the thing that was significant is that they were found in autistic children and their mothers. Bill, was there any correlation between the severity of the mold and the severity of behavioral problems? Uh, she didn't, uh, she didn't uh, get into that, unfortunately. That would have been, uh, that would have made it much more interesting, but um, uh, she did not uh, get into that uh, aspect. So um, uh, I should also say in, in our study that was first done at Children's Mercy Hospital, in addition to seeing the markers went down associated with treating the, uh, the yeast and mold, we also found there was significant improvement in, uh, in behavior. So this is the summary of the uh, Markova study. And I'm going to start here. Remarkably, the unifying finding for, for autistic children and their mothers was the presence in blood of cell wall-free variants from life cycle of filamentous fungi. And there were increased antibodies of the IgG, IgM, and IgA type. These are most of the antibodies, the highest amount of antibodies are of these types, G, A, and M. Together with typical mold growth, um, provided a decisive argument for presence of Aspergillus fumigatus in almost all of the aut autistic uh, children. And And, and, um, and another significant thing is that these forms without the cell wall could be more easily transmi transmitted through the placenta. So her suggestion is that many children with autism um, are, get these mold from the mother because the mother has this defective form of the fungus that makes it easier to pass through the placenta. Uh, and here's all the individual data. Uh, one of the things is they, they made a mistake in the, uh, in the age and forgot the decimal point. So it, <laughs> 99-year-old with autism, it was a 9.9. Uh, and so uh, these were, there were two females, but mostly males, you see under the gender um, uh, title. And, and they also looked at the uh, different fungus that they were able to see either by culturing 
or by looking at under the microscope. And virtually all the children with autism were positive for both, both for mold cultures and for seeing uh, pieces of mold in the uh, microscopic examination of the cultured blood. There was also found, this is what are called antibody titers, um, which means that uh, a normal child is less than one, um, uh, one to 80, meaning a dilution of one to 80 is, uh, and anti, the higher the, the titer, the, or the higher the second number, the more serious the mold infection is. So this first one is one to 160. So that is uh, highly significant. The next one is one to 640, which is a very high titer. So only one of the, only one of the children uh, did not have uh, antibodies to Aspergillus fumigatus. 13 out of 14 did, which is 92%, a very high percentage. They also looked at the uh, cultures of the blood of the mothers of children with autism, and they found that uh, all 14 of the blood cultures of the mother had, uh, had elements of fungi in their blood samples. And this is the microscopic uh, examination. So all of these with the, uh, this goes from, each one of these is a separate child with autism uh, or their mothers, and they all had these long stringy things characteristic of mold when they observed them uh, in cultures of the blood. And uh, these right here, uh, K and L, are cultures of pure Aspergillus fumigatus. So they, they had they had elements that were similar to Aspergillus fumigatus, and they had high antibodies to Aspergillus fumigatus. This Bill, is, is there is there a way to find a professional who can determine whether you do have mold, or is the best way to buy a mold test yourself? Uh, the the way the way to do it absolutely it would be uh, either measuring the metabolites of the mold or by taking a blood sample and doing uh, the uh, the polymerase chain reaction or PCR. So but that not in the person in the house. If you wanted to see if there was mold in your house in different rooms of your house. Oh, okay. So, so you can you could do some things to some. some you can buy these petri dishes at Home Depot and just set them out and see. But the are they accurate? I mean, they're just they're just like a beginning phase. If you don't see anything, it would probably mean you don't. You might not have mold. But if you can smell it or, or, or see anything on your walls, like black or green or stuff on your walls, then you should do, you could send it to a professional lab that does household uh, mold testing. And, and that will give you that information. And, and the, they test for 36 different uh, uh, genuses or genera of uh, of mold, and and uh, that's probably uh, the best way to do it. And then they also give a quantitation, and then they add this all up, and they get what is called an ERMI score. So any ERMI score above, I think it's above a four, is considered significant, and it's not real expensive. Um, Great Plains will be offering it at some time in the future, probably. In, in, uh, in a couple of months. So 92% um, uh, so of the children with uh, autism had high amounts of antibodies to Aspergillus fumigatus and had elements in their blood that were similar to Aspergillus fumigatus. 
And so what are some of the things that are, that are characterized by Aspergillus fumigatus? They produce toxic mycotoxins. When one of the big ones is gliotoxins. And gliotoxins are to toxins that suppress the immune system. They actually break down the DNA of the immune cells. They also produce nanoparticles, small particles that can bind heavy metals. So that could be one reason why children with autism accumulated heavy metals. It could have been because of the mold that has the ability to bind these heavy metals, aluminum, lead, arsenic, cadmium, and mercury. And in addition, everybody inhales an estimated 100 spores of this creature every day. So we're all exposed to this. And however, in recent years, many people have used cortisone and other drugs that are uh, similar to cortisone, like prednisone or prednisolone to treat many different illnesses. And these drugs are, they're very beneficial for you, but they suppress the immune system. And, and as a result of the immune system being suppressed, these uh, hundred or so spores that you're inhaling each day may start to grow because the immune suppressants uh, prevent the immune suppressants uh, allow the Aspergillus fumigatus to, to take over. And it's estimated they may cause more than 600,000 deaths uh, annually. So it's a very deadly, uh, it's a very deadly uh, mold illness. 25 to 90 percent of the people with infections may, may, um, may have a fatal uh, result. And although the spores are a small proportion of all the spores in the hospital, only three tenths of a percent of the spores in the hospital are from of this species, they're responsible for 90% of the hospital infections. So a very small number of spores causes a very high percentage of diseases. So of course, this brings up many different Questions: How can children with autism have this have this uh, very infectious, uh, potentially lethal uh, form of fungus, but it's not killing them? How is that possible? And we don't know all the answers to this, but it's like a, a beachhead for finding out what is uh, what is going on. So uh, gliotoxins, these compounds that attack the immune system are produced by aspergillus and penicillium with the, some of the highest by the species called uh, aspergillus fumigatus. Uh, this is the structure of gliotoxin. It has three different rings with the sulfur molecules attached across to one of these ring structures. And, and studies have shown that gliotoxin causes your DNA to break up. And of course, the DNA is the genetic code. So if it um, breaks up the, the cells in the spleen, then your spleen is one of the organs that's producing the cells of immunity. So you're unable to amount uh, immune, an effective immune response. Uh, this shows the other things. The, the gliotoxin affects the cell membrane. The gliotoxin can have a pronounced effect on, on causing the, the uh, uh, mitochondria to malfunction. And this is important because the mitochondria is the uh, energy source of the cell. Uh, one of the early studies found that okra toxin A, which is the most common mycotoxin, a toxin produced by mold, is uh, maybe the reason for male prevalence, that, that, uh, that uh, uh, males are, are more uh, subject to the toxicity of okra toxin than females are. 
Do you look at the the presence of the gliotoxins in any of your testing? Yes. So our mycotoxin testing checks were uh, the ones I've just mentioned, the ochratoxin A, as well as the uh, the uh, gliotoxins. So all of the major mold toxins are checked for in the mycotoxin test and the organic acid test checks for some of the other compounds like the furan dicarboxylic acid. Are those urine tests? And it yeah, uh, and it's a and both of these are very convenient uh, urine tests. They're, it's very easy to get samples. And if you have little kids who aren't potty trained, we can provide you with uh, tape on bags. Uh, so virtually anybody can get a urine sample and it requires very little urine as well. For, so the vast majority of people don't have any problem uh, in, in uh, getting urine. So, so around the same time as the, uh, the, the, the uh, Dr. Markova was working on this, uh, Dr. Baker and I were working on the case of this uh, uh, little boy with autism uh, who, who was being treated with uh, the drugs itraconazole and Sporinox. So Sporinox is a brand name of, um, of a drug uh, of which, which is a form of itraconazole. So there's many thoughts in this. Some people claim that the brand name drugs are produced more carefully and, and so are uh, more expensive, but are worth the extra money. And other people, of course, claim that that's not true. And I think I would be inclined to think that it might be true that brand name drugs sometimes may be uh, worth the extra money because there's extra care that's gone uh, into it. The, per the person with the brand name drug is the com generally the company that first discovered the drug and they know all the ins and outs of the drug. And so uh, Dr. Baker started treating this um, uh, child with autism uh, in, in using the um, uh, itraconazole and sporinox he first started doing this based on the fact that when he gave uh, one of the uh, probiotics, uh, one of the uh, yeast probiotics, Saccharomyces boulardii, he got a Herxheimer reaction. So he actually saw the Herxheimer reaction as a clue to what was going on. So the Herxheimer reaction is what goes on when you kill uh, an organism that's causing a problem. When you kill that organism, that organism spills its gut, so to speak, so that all the toxic chemicals that were inside that organism come out and the person gets a lot sicker. So he saw that as a clue that, um, that uh, yeast or perhaps mold was a significant problem with that uh, child. And so he continued to uh, increase the uh, doses of the itraconazole and sporinox and, and until he was starting to get uh, favorable uh, results. So these were the uh, symptoms of the child prior to uh, treatment, which I believe was around three or so. Uh, so he had silly behavior, sleep disorders, you know, you know, not sleeping, not going to sleep, not staying to sleep, waking up many times in the middle of the night, waking up screaming, uh, strange poses like uh, like statues that are frozen in uh, in, in 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 time, uh, shrieking sounds. Uh, climbing to high places, getting on top of cabinets and things like that, being extremely hyperactive. And so even though not afraid of climbing to high places, sometimes very afraid of things that are uh, completely harmless. 
uh, sometimes inconsolable crying, the hand flapping many, many times, staring for long spells at fans or lights. Uh, he did have a few words, but he only used those few words when he was very excited. Otherwise, he would not respond to uh, any conversation. Uh, like many children with autism, he would not express his desires verbally, but he would pull the hand of an adult to show, like if he wanted uh, a piece of candy, he would take the hand of his, one of his parents and lead them over to where the candy was. And he would also do this thing in which he would uh, make himself turn blue by holding his breath. So after, after a couple of months of antifungal treatment, all the previous behaviors disappeared. He uh, got on a soccer team and became one of the uh, better soccer players on the team. He also developed uh, excellent musical skills. I've forgotten the instrument, but, uh, but it, was, uh, it was superior. Uh, skills. And, and when he was given an academics uh, test, it was said that he was scoring at the six-year-old level, even though he was only age four. And he also developed significant empathy, which was completely missing before. He, one day after recovery, he saw his uh, father had a, uh, a worried look and he uh, walked up to him and touched him on the knee and said, you don't need to worry about me anymore, dad. I'm completely recovered now. Wow. Uh, so these are the biochemical values. So what Dr. Baker was doing that, the Great Plains was doing the testing. So you see the, one of the mole markers, hydroxymethylferoic was very elevated at baseline. And then uh, after about a month of the antifungal therapy, it decreased from 55 to 1.4. So a 97.5% reduction. The other mold marker, furan dicarboxylic, 56 to 0.45, a 99% decrease. The furan carbonyl glycine uh, didn't decrease as much, but you can see it wasn't that high to begin with. It was, you know, it was not one of the major markers. These are 55, 56. This was only 0.32, but it was still a 37 and a half per, percent reduction. And arabinose, the candida marker, so the child also had a combination of both mold and candida, went from 280 to 94, a 66% uh, reduction. How high do you think the markers should be before you would actually consider treatment? I, I just think any, any, any value above normal, I think is worth trying. And so here is, so then the question is, was this a, an odd thing? And we've seen, a lot of cases since then. It's, it's not the only factor in autism or because we know there's many other factors <coughs> such as, excuse me, I need to take a, I need to take a drink of water. So, um, so what I suspect it may from, from, our studies in the, in the studies of uh, Dr. Markova, 92%, I think a very high percentage. And, uh, you know, whether it's 90% or 50% and whether it varies by geographic region. So I think one of the reasons that antifungal treatment has been so successful uh, and when used in autism is is in treating candida, but what many people didn't realize it was also treating mold simultaneously. So here was another case of a, uh, a second case, a four-year-old with autism in which we tested. 
this child's value of the mold markers was absolutely gigantic. So anything greater than 28 is considered abnormal. This child's was 1,288, nearly 50 times the upper limit of normal. So this child was absolutely, it was almost a, a mold colony. They had so much mold. And the furan dicarboxylic, 44 times the upper limit of normal. And the arabinose was also very high. It was nearly four times, but the mold was much more serious. The difficulty with this is not the family. The difficulty was with the physician. The physician would only give nystatin. And so if the child has nystatin only treats organisms in the intestinal tract, and it's not as effective as the drug like uh, Sporinox or Itraconazole. And, and, um, and, and so the child may have some of the mold as was the, the, uh, the study of Dr. Markova found that all, virtually all the children with autism had the mold in their bloodstream. So nystatin will not kill the mold in the bloodstream you have to have a drug that is systemic. But physicians are afraid of using it for fear that they will be, um, uh, they will be attacked by their colleagues. So- Quack, quack busted. Quack busting, <laughs> yes. So, are, uh, how long is, were these treatments for? How long did it take? So for the child to recover, it was like, it was like two or three months and the child was completely recovered. No symptoms of autism uh, at all, but the child was, so Dr. Baker was not careless in treating this. So the, the drugs used, Sporinox and Intraconazole, in small instances do cause liver disease. So it's one, but it's about one out of 50. So that's only 2%. But in addition, he did liver function tests to make sure there was no liver damage twice a week. Even in those cases where he, the liver enzymes were elevated, when he stopped the, when he stopped the, the drugs, they, there was no problem. Was anything used in conjunction with the drugs like resonance treatment or ozone or binders or No, no, so that's the thing, so that thing, so what this shows is that just antifungal drugs by, the, by themselves in, in suitable cases can be enough to completely uh, treat the problem. The, see, the thing is people use all the binders and things, but the binders only remove the toxins produced by the mold. They don't kill the mold itself. If you use all these binders and charcoal and glutathione, they all help to, re to remove the toxins, but, but then the mold just produce a whole new crop of toxins. So unless you kill the, the, mo the growing mold in the intestine, and in many cases, probably uh, uh, in, in the rest, infecting the rest of the body itself, the, the child is not going to get better. So in addition, uh, the aspergillus also produces elevated oxalates. So, so I've seen so many cases like this that I now believe that oxalates are not primarily from children eating a high oxalate diet. It's the reason that oxalates are elevated uh, in children with autism is primarily because of mold problem. So this child had a value that was Here's the upper limit of normal here. Uh, and here's the child's value way, way out here. So aspergillus it has been proven and other studies that I don't have the slide for, but shows that, uh, that oxalate is a, is a common uh, product of, uh, of, of virtually all species of aspergillus mold. So, so that- high, high oxalates 
should put up your feelers for aspergillus. Absolutely. Yeah. And of course, you know, um, getting rid of high oxalate foods and things can help, but, but not but, enough. But but not enough for probably the majority of children. So all this emphasis on low oxalate diet is completely missing the point that uh, a majority of kids with autism, it's probably of mold origin. Uh, and here's a, here's a published study from the Townsend letter uh, showing the amount of oxalate in, uh, these are all people, not individuals with autism, but in everybody. These are normal controls where just people in the laboratory, the mean and uh, standard deviation. And these are the people that had mold, the amount of oxalate. So extremely significant, the probability less than one in the hundred that values this extreme would be due to chance. So oxalates are associated with people that had mold markers. Bill, I know this is an, um, all about autism and I appreciate this Autism Research Coalition, but can you extrapolate this to adults with Parkinson's, MS, even cancer? All of those. So we found mold is an issue in every neuropsychiatric disease, every single one. So, so this is something, you know, 2,500 years ago, the Bible said you better watch out for mold. And I can say the same thing is true today as was true in the time of Leviticus. If you got a mold problem, it is by far one of the most common things in Parkinson's, one of the most common, uh, one of the most common abnormalities, even in, uh, in, in Lou Gehrig's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So it's extremely exciting, the uh, scope of, this is a whole new field of medicine, a whole new set of treatments. And it's giving, I, I think a whole, uh, a whole set of, of um, uh, expectations for hope in, in treating so many uh, diseases because this is such a, a, a you know, such a, a very common. And ubiqu it's so ubiquitous and it, it, it continuously happens with storm after storm after storm that new people I, are I, getting infected. That was, that was one of the first papers that showed that uh, following hurricanes, there was a, a increased, uh, incidents of, of uh, autistic symptoms that they, uh, that, that uh, children were in these flood damaged homes were much more likely to develop autism and have autism symptoms. So it is uh, something that simple in having uh, water damaged homes due to, to uh, storms and hurricanes or flooding. Either one can be extremely uh, toxic to the uh, people. How much pushback are you getting from the traditional medical models? Is it similar to talking about food? Uh, no, I, I'd say, you know, well, I think we're getting, you know, probably uh, a better reception. There's a, you know, I mean, a pretty large medical group now that's, that is uh, sold on the idea that the mold is causing severe problems. Great. Uh, so this shows that same, uh, that same two-year-old who had some of the organic acid markers extremely high, also had a high okra toxin, but not quite as high as the other uh, mold markers and the uh, oxalate. Uh, so here is an uh, adult uh, with autism who, who at the time of the test had severe head banging, just banging the uh, head back and forth 145 times the wow. upper limit of normal uh, for, a, 
for a mycotoxin found in three different genera of mold. So perhaps hundreds of different species, and we don't know. We don't know where this is coming from. We don't didn't find any evidence of of the um, of the uh, problem in the house. So this is one one of the cases we're actively uh, working on. But what we're seeing from this is this, this is a widespread problem, and and it would be and of course we're going to look at this. It would be remarkable if an adult who's already had uh, many different treatments for autism unsuccessfully, if perhaps this is the one, this is the one factor that might be missing. And is and this, is this the, the way your mycotoxin prints out, your mycotoxin yes. test? Yes, this is the exact printout from the mycotoxin test. So what you see on this is uh, the name of the compound produced by uh, the different mold. Uh, you see the, uh, the normal values are less than 25, but this had this wow. the value of <laughs> 627. Wow. And, then, and then we have the black line that simulates the degree of abnormality. So it's going completely off the scale. It is so high. And down below, it's indicating um, it, uh, one of the big things, it can cause kidney damage, ne uh, nephropathy, uh, because it, it causes changes in the permeability. Um, and it's also been linked to suppression of the immune system. And, and so, of course, these things are relatively new. So we don't know all of the things that are uh, that are happening, um, all of the different damage. And, and so finding this in an adult with autism who has not responded to any other treatment and then seeing a value 150 times normal, it, you know, it makes me... Uh, it gives makes, you chills. It really it, gives maybe you we're, chills. Maybe we're going to hit it with this. <laughs> right. So here is one, uh, a 13 year old uh, with autism and has the, uh, the molds, mycotoxins that are associated with stachybotrys. This is another case. And they have uh, values that are, are uh, very high. Stachybotrys is one that, you know, there've been cases on TV where you see the baby was sick for years because the baby's bed was was near a moldy place in the room or a vent that had uh, the stachybotrys uh, mold growing. And this is one that's very commonly found with uh, water damage, but occasionally maybe due to contaminated food. What I find is in the United States and Europe, most of the cases are gonna be due to water damaged houses but in uh, Asia or in Africa, where there's, uh, there, there's more poverty, the people can't just, they, won't, they can't throw away peanuts because they had some mold on them. I mean, they don't have it. They throw away the peanuts, they're gonna starve. So they have to eat mold contaminated foods. Uh, so this is the second showing the second page of the mycotoxin test, showing another uh, mycotoxin, Roradine, that was very uh, elevated. And here's yet another case of another different three-year-old with autism. And is this because of a moldy house? So the okra toxin in this child, and what we found is that the really the, the upper limit of normal is around, um, is around six. So this child's value is 28 times the upper limit of normal and gliotoxin is 200 times the upper limit of normal. And this mycophenolic acid, which is a mycotoxin that's also used as a drug is 11 times the upper limit. Of normal. So this kid is absolutely loaded with mold. So the first thing they do is 
uh, they test the house. And so they put Petri dishes all throughout the house. But what shows up or the type of mold that was found was called cladosporium mold, which was not thought to be very toxic. So, so it either could be that there's something, he's getting the mold from somewhere else or that they're wrong, that the cladosporium mold is much more toxic than people thought about. So you can see these Petri dishes were scattered all throughout the house and most of the mold was identified as cladosporium. So was the house the source of mold? Um, so, so one of the things they do when they test houses, they test the inside of the house, but they also put some, uh, put some testing devices, excuse me, uh, outside the house. They wanna see maybe is that house higher than the air outside. And in this case, uh, it, it, the, um, it, it was not. But, but they also found the child had okra toxin and gliotoxin, which both which are characteristic of Aspergillus uh, fumigatus, which is the one that was found to, to be predominant in the Markova study. And so I think it would be a good idea to test the mother. It's a possible that the child got it not from the house, but from the mother. Uh, uh, so if the child's got it from, and, and that the child got it prenatally. So how do you treat the person who has mold? If the person has mold in the gastrointestinal tract and or the blood, antifungal treatment is essential. It doesn't matter how many binders or charcoal or glutathione or other kinds of things that you clay because they only re remove the latest crop of mycotoxins. They don't kill the mold itself. And, it's, and so if the mold has gone into the bloodstream, nystatin also won't kill the mold. So nystatin will be effective if the mold is only in the intestinal tract, but won't be effective if it's in the blood. So, Itraconazole or Sporinox, the brand name, will be absorbed, but in one in 50 people, it can cause liver toxicity. So if you use the drug, it's, it's probably a good idea if it's being used in the child to do these liver function tests that are called AST and ALT uh, twice a week. And, and the biggest problem is that there's not enough physician who are willing to, to take the risk of flack from medical boards to use the drugs that, that are most effective. And so um, if there are physicians listening to this, I'd like to find out if you would be willing uh, to treat patients who require it. If, they, if you treat the patient with Nystatin and you see it hasn't done the job, would you be willing to try uh, uh, Sporinox or other, uh, other drugs such as Voriconazole is also used for uh, species like Aspergillus fumigatus? Would you be willing to do this? If you are, you could contact me in Great Plains. We won't put your name on a list, but what we would do is we would give your name out. If somebody calls in from a particular state and wants treatment, uh, we, could, we could set up a referral. But because of the issue of the uh, liver function, we would not put your name on a list. We would keep it as like a, just a, a, a confidential uh, resource that would be given out to people who ask for it. Do you think it's a it's an ignorance about it or it's an unwillingness? I know, unfortunately, I think it's a real, it is a real problem for, um, and so I think that, so one of the very important thing, it's very important for people, for the physicians to do the test, documenting that there is a serious problem. 
uh, I think, and, uh, and uh, oh, another thing is the Great Plains is, is duplicating the Markova studies. So we've, we've uh, uh, gotten a, a hundred volunteers to provide uh, samples and we're going to uh, duplicate and then publish that on an even larger group. And so that will, that It'll should help to reduce the, any stigma that physicians might be afraid of. But, um, but these drugs are the ones that are recommended by the, the infectious disease doctors, the Association of right. Infectious Disease Doctors for Treating Mold. Is there any reason to use Sporinax and Nystatin together? Uh, it, you know, I guess it would just be, it probably wouldn't be harmful. It's redundant though. And, and no, it's possible there could be, you know, an organism that might be more susceptible in the GI tract to uh, Nystatin. I don't think I would be against it. I, I don't think there's, at this point, there would be evidence for it or against it. How about zinc? Does it? There's a question about the I, role I would of zinc. definitely, I would definitely give zinc supplementation to enhance the immune system. You would. You yeah. would add zinc. Yeah. So, so the antifungal needs to be the first if the child if the child has the mold, but the mycotoxins can be removed by the binders once the once the uh, underlying mold is treated, so glutathione, N-acetylcysteine, charcoal, clay, uh, combined charcoal, and one of the products is called GI Detox from New Beginnings. So binders will not remove molds in the GI tract or other tissues producing mycotoxins and thus will never effectively treat patients who don't get uh, adequate uh, antifungal treatment. So to summarize, the research published first in the year 2000 indicated that mold products from Aspergillus species were commonly elevated in urine samples of children with autism. And the fact that these metabolites decreased after Nystatin indicated that at least some of the mold was present in the GI tract. Uh, and the paper in Nature by Markova indicates almost all children with autism and their mothers had mold elements in their blood. 92% of the children had uh, antibodies to Aspergillus fumigatus indicating a previous infection with this organism. And it is one of the most deadly species of Aspergillus uh, responsible for 90% of hospital infections. Study provides strong evidence that mothers may infect their children in utero by having these incomplete L forms that lack a cell wall, which would pass through the placenta more easily. And the mothers themselves may, may have used uh, immune suppressing drugs such as cortisone, prednisone, prednisolone that impairs the immune system, or <coughs> they have biologic agents, things, uh, biochemicals produced from pharmaceutical company that have grown in cell cultures uh, or compounding pharmacies that didn't use sterile technique and so became uh, uh, contaminated. So these are all possibilities and all of these things need to be looked at. And so another big controversy I can see coming up in the future, where did they get these things from? So the Great Plains has uh, initiated a research study to duplicate the Markova study on a larger group of uh, children. And I found out there's uh, already, there was a clinic that uh, just passed on to me anecdotally that they found 
very high incidence of Aspergillus fumigatus in most of their children with autism. The research study is now full, so don't, don't call asking to be added because it is full, but we, the, um, uh, the testing will now be available, but will be available commercially, but not as part of the research study. So uh, at this point, I will uh, be glad to uh, take questions. Well, I've got put most of the questions in as you've been talking, but there's still a couple. Um, after you've done this antifungal treatment and you've seen the numbers change, is there any kind of maintenance necessary to keep them down? Uh, that I mean, that's a that's a that's a good. Uh, uh, I mean, a very good question. So is. Um, uh, I don't. I don't think we have enough information at this point. This is gonna. This is gonna uh, come about when we have, you know, twenty-five different physicians who are willing to uh, to uh, work with this treatment and 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 start testing hundreds of kids. We'll we'll start having the uh, answers to that. In this, put in this one particular case study the of the uh, the child with the uh, rapid recovery. And by the way, so this, as far as I know, this was the uh, most rapid recovery of any child from autism that's ever been uh, reported just a few months. You know, there have been other cases, but most of the other cases have required six months or a year or a couple years. Uh, so this this indicates that this was a, the fact that the recovery was so fast indicates that, you know, it was a uh, a major cause of the uh, of the autism. And so, um, are you recruiting then for your Markova study? Well, no, no Markova. So we've we've filled. That's the one that's full. It's full, but in you know in in gearing up for that study, the tests are, are now available for anybody who wants it. So you, but you need a, uh, a physician request. Right. Uh, uh, or if, you know, and we think that, that having a physician request is the best because if you do this test without a physician, you won't be able to to get the necessary treatment uh, most places in the world because for, for a drug like uh, Sporinox or Itraconazole, you're gonna need a request. A chiropractor won't be able to do it. Uh, a naturopath might be able to do it in some states. A physician's assistant might be able to do it, but, uh, or a nurse practitioner might be able to do uh, it. However, Are you treating some of the mothers? And uh, so, so that hasn't been done yet, but I think that would be very interesting because you would expect that the mothers themselves may be having uh, some significant uh, problems. And so some of the other issues that are common in women are things like chronic fatigue syndrome. It was about 95% of people with chronic fatigue syndrome have significant problems with mold. So it'd be very interesting to, to check the mothers too. And in the uh, study that Great Plains is doing, where we are testing the mothers as well to, uh, again, to confirm the uh, incidence of the mold in the mothers as well as the uh, children. And, and to emphasize again, even though this is an important issue with autism, it's an important issue across the board. We find that virtually all neurologic, all psychiatric diseases, there's a high percentage. I'm not saying it's the only factor, but it is a common factor. You know, at, you know, maybe uh, thirty percent or or higher in some cases of people with. A, a variety of neurologic and psychiatric problems. So the oldest 
person that you've treated now is this one adult that you yes. had who was how old? Uh, uh, I, I don't want to give uh, specific information, but, okay. they, but they were a complete adult. Uh huh. And so it's not too, it's never too late. You can work on that's adults what I, with that's what, I, uh, that's what I hope. So, so the treatment has not been initiated. Okay. Well, Bill, this has been remarkable. This is, this is a game changer, isn't it? I hope so. I think it yeah. is. And I once again, you're at the forefront of changing the game. So uh, it's, it's really exciting work you're doing and congratulations. And it's, I'm, I'm honored to know you and to have followed your path through this. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Patty. You, you are very helpful and you've been, you've been a, a, a very good uh, friend and colleague uh, all these years. Thank well, it's, it's been wonderful. So how can people reach um, your lab? You want to give an email for them if they have more questions? Yeah, uh, they, I mean, they can just, uh, uh, I mean, the easiest thing would be a phone call. Uh, 913-284. No, excuse me. No, I'm just starting to give you my home number. That would be a disaster. <laughs> 913 341 8949. Great. Well, thank I, you I'm again. Gonna, actually, I'm going to write it. I'm going to write it 913 okay. 41 8949. And then, of course, the uh, website www.gpl4. For you dot com, so that's the website, and you it will give the contact information to customer service to get it going. As I as I said, um, that the best thing to do is to have a uh, a physician order it because you will need a physician. Um, you'll need a physician for treatment. Uh, and, and I hope there are physicians who are listening to this, who yeah. might be willing to prescribe the, the, uh, the, the drugs using uh, proper monitoring of liver function, the AST and the ALT. And if they'll um, uh, contact me or customer service, uh, we'll be put them into, we won't put their uh, names in writing, but we'll keep them and make them available for people who are looking for a, a physician who will help with this uh, therapy. And so what we want the physician to order is, are your two tests, the mycotoxin test and they, the OAT? Yes, the OAT and the, and the mycotoxin test on urine, and they can also order the aspergillus fumigatus on blood serum. On what? On uh, on blood serum, the uh, a blood sample. So it's both blood and urine. But the but the but the urine is the easiest and the uh, and and one of the uh, most important tests. If you so if you can only get the urine, that's fine. If you can get the blood serum uh, doing the aspergillus fumigatus uh, antibody test, will it's also be, be available as well. Okay. Thank you again, Bill. It's been remarkable. Thank you, Patty. Okay. Thanks for your help. Bye-bye.